Father, but we want our city, we want our nation to be captured by your greatness, Father. Lord God, we want to confess that so many times we've lost the wonder of you. And so many times it's been so normal and mediocre. And that's why, Father, we need a touch from you, Lord. Here, as we sing, Father, as we sing about your greatness, as we look to you as we shift our focus to you lord i pray that you would touch our hearts and touch our eyes lord that we would once again see and be in awe of you lord be in awe of your greatness build your kingdom Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
So, Father, I pray that we as your church would arise, Lord, would arise out of every shackle that may be holding us back, Father. Everything and every, every pattern of life and lifestyle and every pattern of thinking that does not align with you, Father, I pray that you would, by your transforming power, by, by the work of your spirit and by the power of your word, that you would begin to strip away those shackles so that your church can arise full and free and with boundless power, God, to, to work your works here in this place, Lord. And so, Father God, here today, Jesus, we want to arise out of every negative thought, out of every negative thinking, God, and of every voice that, that seems to pull us away from your perfect will in our lives, Father. Lord God, we want to tune in to what you say over us, Father God. This is our desire, Lord. This is our desire, Father. We are seeking you. We are seeking your face. Come on, church. Can we just lift up our hands just for a few moments and just seek his face? Let's shift our focus to him today. Shift our focus to him. There may be many things that's happening in our lives today, but in this moment, come on, just shift your focus and say, Father, I want to look to you, Jesus. My eyes are on you, Jesus. My eyes are on you. Those who look to him will never be put to shame. Those who look to him will never be put to shame. He is near to those who are brokenhearted. He is near to those who, are, who, who put, his, put their hope in his steadfast love. And his love is, is steadfast. It is here today. It hasn't changed. He is still the God of compassion. He's still the God who is near to the brokenhearted. He is the unchanging God. And Jesus, here we are, Father. We want to fix our eyes on you, Lord, for who you are, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God.
when I am falling short and when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours and I believe, oh, I believe what you say of me, yes, I When I can feel a thing, you say I am strong. When I think I am weak, you say I am held. When I am falling short, and when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe what you say.
that I struggle with the voices that we fight that keep us from being who we are meant to be Father but the one thing that I know for sure is that I need you above all else you're the only one who meets the need of my heart you're the only one who really truly quenches the thirst the cravings, the longings of my heart, Lord. So here I am, Lord. Here we are, Lord.
the altar, the fire. chapter 5 verse 14 say but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil now that is what I want my people to grow up to to be able to distinguish good from evil, you'd have to train yourself constantly by taking solid food and stop desiring spoon feeding and only soft milk. How long can we go on taking this liquid food? And the reason I teach the kind of uh, teaching that I do here for all of you is, remember God's dream for you. If you have been listening to my message, I very often repeat it. What is God's dream for you and for me? Somebody must be remembering. I keep telling you repeatedly. What does God want us to be? Huh? You forgot. I feel so bad that I am not a good teacher. My, eh? God's dream for you and me is that he wants us to be like his son Jesus. And that is where we need to grow to. To be like Jesus. Not just to get into heaven not just to have eternal life, not just to have all the glories and all the beautiful gardens and all the beautiful things in heaven. That is not the ultimate purpose of God for your life. God's purpose for your life is that he wants to see you like his son, Jesus Christ. Can you say with your mouth, confess, God the Father wants me to be like his son Jesus. Don't forget that. Next time, next Sunday when I ask, please don't look at each other. You shout it. God's dream for us is that we be like Jesus. And how are we going to be like Jesus? That is my, my text is Matthew chapter 13 verses 47 to 48. To save time, I'm not going to read uh, the whole passage. Well, let me read it anyway. 
47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked the disciples. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his uh, hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this a carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them only in his hometown, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. The book of Acts chapter 20, verse 27. I want all of you to listen very carefully and to take down these references and you need to study these at home. Verse 27 says, Apostle Paul says, he's giving a farewell uh, address to uh, these people at Ephesus. And uh, in conclusion he says, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And that is my purpose. You need to know the whole will of God that has been revealed from heaven to us. They are all revealed in this world. Jesus Christ came as the final and one complete revelation from God. And whatever he has taught us, he taught us the whole plan of God, whole will of God for our lives. Are we, how are we in our spiritual life? That is my concern. And may I talk to you from my heart this morning. Does Jesus offend you? If you are a serious reader of God's word, and if you have not grown up properly, then many things you read in the New Testament as Jesus' words will certainly going to offend you. We don't like people to offend us, especially in the matter of religion and faith. Why is it that so many churches proclaim only half the gospel, the attractive half? I want you to listen every word that I utter here and understand. It is true that our risen Lord Jesus Christ has overcome by defeating sin, Satan, and curses, and death itself. Now he offers to those who believe peace, joy, heaven, and eternal life. 
which we all enjoy hearing about. But I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that there is another side to the gospel. Did you know that? Has anybody told you that these blessings are not the only gospel? That is one side of the gospel. But there is another side to the gospel, a side which in some sections of the church is being played down, ignored, or even rejected, and never mention anything about that side in their preaching. Please note that these sections of the church, is, uh, the church what they are doing to the people, that these are the very words and sayings of Jesus Christ which are overlooked or set aside without mentioning it. Have a look at some of such sayings. Dying in order to live. Losing in order to find. Going down in order to go up. Freedom in the midst of slavery and success through failure, so on and so on. Have you noticed these topics in the teachings of Jesus and in the Gospels and in the letters of the Apostle Paul and Apostles? Many Christians sidestep those issues and focus instead on more appealing ideas. And what are the, some of these appealing ideas? I'll just mention just a few. Prosperity gospel, healing for all, obtaining heaven here, now. The point I am trying to make is this, my brothers. When we ignore the tough sayings of Jesus, we end up with a form of Christianity that has little cutting edge and is devoid of power. And that is what we see these days happening. The faith is shallow. And there is so much of superficiality in their Christianity. And the only things they run after are the blessings, blessings, blessings. Until today, the church is reduced to a bless me club. And even today, after this, you will say, oh, there is no blessing today. But if you are a serious Christian, wanting to do and live in the will of God, you will be tremendously blessed if you listen carefully and take it to heart. Do you want a powerful life or a shallow life? Do you want to be an overcomer or always going under the temptations and under the circumstances? That is the difference I'm talking about. Focusing only on the attractive part of the gospel may fill the pews. And that also we see today. You visit any church of a prosperity gospel. Thousands, thousands people are jumping, shouting. And if you will listen to their messages carefully, you will notice that they never mention sin. 
They were never mentioned the need to repent. And they never mentioned the judgment of God that is coming. They never mentioned the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They never mentioned these things. The only things that will sell and bring great profit for the preacher is blessings, blessings, blessings. And while that kind of ministry will fill the pew, it leaves the heart half empty. The straightforward truths of the gospel, like comfort, rest, peace, joy, and so on, are very important. We don't neglect it. We thank God for them. But equally important are the truths in the tough sayings of Jesus, which add depth and meaning and maturity to our discipleship. Again, where do you want to remain? And what do you want to remain as? Just a Christian? Just a believer? Or do you want to go on to become disciples as Jesus taught us? Here again, it is your choice. What do you want to be? And where do you want to remain and stay on and never progressing? We have Christianity and churchianity and um, all these believers. And when we talk only about believing, we are putting ourselves with the devil because he is a better believer than many of the so-called Christians. Is it where we understand Jesus never taught us that way? He talked about discipleship. He called the people to follow him and be a disciple. And then he taught them through some tough saying who can be worthy to be his disciples. And do you know that you need to be worthy to be his disciples? And how can you be worthy? Read his teaching on discipleship. Some tough saying. And he said, this is hard. So I don't think I can be a disciple. You who come here Sunday after Sunday, sit under the teaching of God's word. It may be tough. But one day you are going to rejoice that you are made strong. People invite me, pastors invite me to go and have a three days of Bible study. And now in the, this month I am going to Bareilly to teach about the Holy Spirit for three days. And whenever they invite me, I always make it a point to tell, let them know that I am not the kind of prophet that they are expecting. I don't talk about manifestations and miracles and all these sort of things. All these things happen in my meeting. I believe it. But you know how it happened? People hear the word of God and it is the word that to help them to have faith and that faith will lead them to experience the impossible things in their lives so I tell them and you know what reply they give pastor that is exactly the reason we are inviting you to come 
Because these days we have so many preachers coming, so many preachers, and they talk nothing but manifestations and miracles and healings, and these are all things. So my people are going like children. They are not growing. They need solid word. And I could see when I go and preach how intently they listen and they take in as hungry people. And I can see the hunger there is in their hearts for the solid word of God. Do you think crowd won't come? More crowd will come where there is solid preaching of God's word. Someone said, it is only as we grapple that we grow. Grapple with what? With the tough saying of Jesus. And this is something that we don't want to do. We don't want to grapple with the tough saying of Jesus. We want that soft. Softly and tenderly. As a result, a believer of 25 years, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, they go around with a tag. Fragile, handle carefully. Why you remain fragile? And if you don't treat carefully and softly, my goodness, tomorrow they will be sitting in some other church. You must have a tag around you. Handle me in any way you want, I am tough. That is where you need to grow as a child of God. Remember our theme. What is the theme? This year is a year of growth. How are we going to grow? We will grow only when we learn to face the tough situations and tough saying of Jesus and grapple with it. Then growth will happen. You remember the two buildings? The parable of two buildings? One building was built on what? On sand. Another building was built on what? On rock. Now which building stood firm when the storm came? the house on the rock. And I am sad to say that most Christians are being built on sand. And I want you to be built on rock. Solid rock. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And who shall enter into it? The violent shall enter into it. Violent faith, tough faith, is built up by tough people willing to accept and obey the tough saying of Jesus Christ. Did you get that? How do you, how do you uh, produce violent faith? We need to be people of violent faith. What is violent faith? Violent faith is a faith that keeps on overcoming any kind of the strongest storm and the strongest and the highest mountain and any kind of Goliath on the way, that is a violent faith. What kind of faith do you and I have? Violent faith is a faith that takes no, no from Jesus. Like that woman. Violent faith, tough 
tough faith is built by those people who are willing to accept the tough saying of Jesus and to obey the tough saying of Jesus. They will be tough in their faith. And I pray that people who sit under my ministry will grow to have a violent kind of faith. Violent kind of faith is a faith that we see in Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. Where when the angel of the Lord told him, Jacob, you leave me, I want to go. And what did Jacob say? You go. But not before you bless me. You can go, but you'll have to drag me behind you. I will not leave you. It may take another week, it may take another year, it may take another two years or three years. How much time it takes, I don't care, but I am not going to leave you until you bless me and I know that I am blessed. That is violent faith, that is tough faith. All of us have faith. But where, what is the level of your faith? No faith, little faith, great faith, perfect faith. These are the levels of faith. Are you climbing upward or downward in the level of faith? And Jesus Christ always had problem with little faith. Among whom? Among his disciples, among his own people. No faith, and even if they have faith, little faith. Oh, ye of little faith, how long you want me to be with you? And you remain with a little faith. But Jesus was encouraged by seeing great faith. You know among whom? Among the Gentiles. You know, the tendency among some contemporary Christians to focus only on those parts of the gospel that are appealing. The problem of this, such behavior, is that a people get only half a gospel. Thus, instead of producing strong disciples, We are producing superficial, surface Christians whose faith crumbles in the face of a little storm, in the face of persecutions, and in the face of little problems. That is the problem. Where do you want to remain? Why is that we get panic when some sudden, unforeseen things unfavorable to us happen? Because we are remaining that shallow faith. We have not learned to grapple with the tough saying of Jesus. As long as Jesus come to you and There was a sister who had a vision. In her dream, she saw three sisters sitting and praying. And Jesus appeared to them. And he came first to the first woman, kneeling and praying. And he spent considerable time with that sister, cajoling her and, and, and a small thing, her with her, rubbing her back and all this sort of thing, and whispering to her certain things. And she spent, he spent a considerable time. And the second sister, also Jesus went to her. 
With her also, he spent some time, but not as much as he spent with the first sister. After comforting her and touching her, and, she, and with the third sister, he didn't even look at her, she just passed by. He just had a look at her and she passed by. And this sister who had this dream, she asked God, God, what, what does this mean? Why you spend more time with the first one and lesser time with the second and the third one? You didn't even bother to stop and sit with Are you getting the point? How many of you got the point? That first one needed much care, like a child, and if he doesn't spend much time, she will crumble. The second one which is stronger, but not as much. But the third one he know, I don't have to stand with. Can just know she he knew how strong she was in the faith. And in her love for Jesus, in her confidence in Jesus, in her trust in Jesus. She didn't need Jesus to stand there and cajole her and pat her back and all that. She whether she did it or not. She loved him with his, her whole heart. That was the kind of love and faith that she had. How about us? How many of us would be happy to see that Jesus is spending time with others and he hardly spend any time with you? Will you still be able to love him as much more than others? Will you still have the confidence in Jesus and trust in Jesus and she will rise up from there shouting hallelujah? Jesus didn't spend any time with her, but she knows her faith is tough. Her love is tough. We are producing superficial surface Christians whose faith crumbles in some small, in front of some small problem. And then we ask the question, why is this? One reason could be, is because the tough sayings of Jesus contain ideas that challenge our self-centeredness and cut deep into our carnal nature. The tough sayings of Jesus, it hit our self-centeredness very hard. And that probably the reason why we they are not willing to take or preach the tough saying of Jesus. So contrary are our Lord's principles to fallen human nature that at times they appear puzzling and even offensive. Take this. He says to one, follow me, let the dead Go and bury the dead. You follow me. Or consider this statement made to the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7, verse 27. First, let the children eat all they want. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Jesus is tough, isn't it? How does you, how do you want him to treat you? Even after 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. 
Are you able to take this kind of saying to you? These tough sayings of Jesus present us with the tough issues that we have to wrestle with in order to fully comprehend them. In fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount contains some of the toughest sayings of Jesus. I want to read one of them. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 29 and 30 and 39. 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gog it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Verse 39, he says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You read the entire Sermon on the Mount. Do we actually follow any one of them? Or you read and say, this is a tough say. Those who want to settle for uh, the, for, for a soothing kind of religion, prefer the comfortable words of the gospel. Like, come unto me, all of you who are weary and tired. I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, how long you remain in this stage. But please mark this. In grappling with the seemingly confusing and hard sayings of Jesus Christ, we come up against important issues which strikes at those things which hinder our progress and prevent us from being the kind of disciples Jesus wants us to be. We must always think, Lord, what kind of disciple you want me to be? What kind of a follower you want me to be? Jesus would like to look at you and address you as his disciple, not just a believer. If he did not confront these issues, then although we may call ourselves Christians or believers, we cannot really call ourselves disciples. I read the New Testament, including the Gospel, which is very important, where we read this tough saying. He never addressed his followers as Christians or believers. He always addressed them as my disciple. He called his disciples. He would like to call as his disciples to himself very often. And they take us further and further into higher and higher revelation. How do you receive a higher revelation? Unless you get a lower level revelation concerning God and his purposes. 
and obey them, you cannot expect any higher revelation. Let me conclude by saying this. Our toughest battles are not with the devil. In fact, if you understand the battles in our faith, devil is inconsequent. He should not be there. But our toughest battles are with God. How many of you knew it? If you didn't know it, know it today. For it is easier for us to say no to the devil than to say yes to God. Did you know that? Saul of Tarsus. Ever since the martyrdom of Stephen, this battle was going on within the heart of Saul of Tarsus. That scene kept coming back to him with a strong message from God saying, Saul, you are wrong. Repent and change. Jesus Christ is the only way. And you know what he was doing? He kept resisting it. Resisting it. But it took a strong revelation, a vision of the glory of the risen Lord to struck him down flat on the ground and blinded him. And in that condition, he heard the voice of the Lord. Saul, Saul, Stop kicking against the gold. Your heart is pricking, isn't it? How long are you going to kick against that prick? Yield yourself to that prick, Saul. He said, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What we do is to keep on kicking against the prick. We find it so hard to say yes to the Lord. We are not ready and many of us are not prepared and many of us are not ready. God, you have blessed me and I have eternal life. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I have healing and I have heaven. I am not trying to prepare you only for heaven. It is my desire that the word of the Lord by the Holy Spirit will penetrate your heart. That you will begin to be like Jesus. Shall we stand? And you go with this thought and examine yourself. It is true. Our toughest battle is against God. For Paul, there was no looking back again because he was dealt in a very tough way. And he became the toughest apostle, preacher of the gospel and the builder of the church of Jesus Christ. Became so tough, he said, nothing in this entire world or universe can separate to me from the love of God. Nothing. Sword or famine or death or persecution or uh, height or any nothing will separate me. Are we there yet? Can separate me from the love of God. And at the end, 
as we bow his head for the soldiers to chop off his head. What kind of man was he? The toughest person these soldiers have ever met. He shouted, I have kept the faith and I ran the race. I completed the race and I fought the good fight. Now I am going. I am not dying, soldiers. I am going. My king is waiting there for me. And he has a crown for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up our hands. Just give him thanks and praising to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And as you go and live your life during this week, I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to bring into your remembrance the toughest saying of Jesus Christ. And you will, when you read your Bible, look for the tough sayings of Jesus. Accept them. Obey them. And you will be the toughest person the devil has ever seen. God bless you all.